I was thinking, um, it's been, with nobody was here, it was, it was hard to preach to just the camera and just, you know, a handful of people that were helping with the live stream. And now that we're back together, it's, it's almost as hard to not see any facial expressions with face mask on. <laughs> So, it's uh, definitely different times. I was telling Belinda this morning, my brother sent me a meme yesterday in text and said that once COVID's over, we're going to have to wear a mask backwards to straighten our ears back out <laughs> for the next two months. So, but we are back in First Thessalonians this morning. And chapter 4, verses uh, going to be going, starting at verse 13, going through verse 18. I'm hoping this... This brings us a good sense of hope and joy this morning. It says this, Brothers, we do, do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left to the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you give us encouragement and hope, especially in these times, Lord, that last week, as we learned, we have instruction. Lord, it's, it's not without, without hope, though. So I pray this morning you would come and minister to us. And let this hope set deep inside of us so that we can be a shining light to all that we come in contact with for your glory. I pray this in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen. So th this passage is actually often read at, at funerals to give the listeners hope. I actually just used this passage at Richard Watson graveside service a couple weeks ago. But with that hope comes two assumptions, right? First is that the deceased, the one you're there for, was a believer, and that the listeners themselves are believers. Because if neither of those are true, then there really is no hope found in this passage. But for those of us who are believers, we find great hope. And we're hoping that that also can give those that are looking for hope to find it here. And they too become believers. And then this passage is also referenced many times uh, to speak of, of post-tribulation, pre-tribulation argument, and when we're going to be called to heaven, and so on and so forth. Now, the, these arguments are often based on selfish motive and not on the one that brings glory to God. So we would not be diving into that part this morning. However, we do know that one day our King, Jesus, is going to return. And when that happens, nobody really knows. But we rejoice in knowing that that will happen, that that is, in fact, true. The Thessalonian church, right, they, they had obvious doubts here. They had obvious questions. If they didn't, I don't think Paul would be really writing about it. So this is, this is obvious. He says, brothers, Paul wrote, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. All right, I, I like even he uses the terms fall asleep and say who have died. He says, no, they've fallen asleep. This is Jesus has said that because we will see them again. Before the revelation of, of God in the Lord Jesus' death in the pagan world, th this was the literal end, right? When somebody dies, people who aren't saved, say, we're never going to see them again. I don't know how we're going to see them again. We have no hope. And Thessalonica, Macedonia, well, that was a pagan area. It was a pagan city. You found right, last week that they were into sexual perversion and sexual prostitution, all for the worshiping of their gods there. And here they even had no, no hope. And they had, there was an inscription found outside the city of Thessalonica, Thessalonica that showed their lack of hope. It said this, it, 
After death, no reviving. After the grave, no meeting again. That sounds like a hopeless phrase to me. Once they're gone, that's it. We can't bring them back, and we're never going to see them again. Which kind of makes sense while they're living to any type of selfish or selfish desire that they have right now because they think there is nothing eternal afterward. But these believers are now learning that's not the case. And Paul is reassuring them that's not the case here. Death for the Christian is entirely different for, from that of the unbeliever. Because we share, as believers, we share in Christ's victory over death. And that, that's where we find our hope. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian, was martyred for his faith by the Nazis in days before the end of the Second World War in 1945. But before he was executed, he said this, This is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. Dietrich knew where he was going. He knew, hey, as Jay said many times in funerals, we're leaving the land of the dead and now going to the land of the living and we'll be alive forever. Death is, is but a gateway to the presence of God, right? People have said, many want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> That's the path we must take to get to see God in person, is to die. So Christians are inspired and comforted by, by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we, we may mourn for ourselves and, and our own sense of personal loss, but we don't need to mourn over those who have passed, or believers that have passed before us, as the world does, right? Because we have hope in Christ and who he is and the promise he gives us. In this passage, Paul launches into one of the great fundamental faiths or truths of the, of the Christian faith, okay? And he, he marries the passing of buddy, some, somebody, the passing of a believer, to the second coming of Christ. Yes, we're going to see them again, but we're also, those who are alive when God comes back, we're going to see each other again. When Jesus died on the cross, the vast majority of his countrymen thought that they seemed the last of him. But those who witnessed his resurrection and his ascension, they knew better, especially those who saw his ascension, right? They, they recall Jesus' teaching of his coming kingdom, and it became absolutely clear to them that the next event in God's calendar was the second coming of Jesus, the coming of our king. So the angelic messenger had predicted when Jesus ascended, he says to the people looking as Jesus went up, he first said, like, why are you still looking? Well, first of all, I'm looking up because so, somebody just floated into the sky. And, but the angel's asking him, what are you doing? And he says, this same Jesus will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Say, hey, he's going to come down this very same way that you saw him go up. You can find that in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. No wonder then that Paul writes authoritatively here. He says, we believe. We tell you that. Hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm not saying this might happen. This is absolutely going to happen. There is no doubt. It, it was a statement of the fact that's yet to be realized. A bit of a prophecy here. God's going to come down. He told this himself. It was the blessed hope that sustained Paul in many of his trials of life. So Paul, he makes four points here concerning the second coming of Christ. And the first is the return of the king. We see this in the first sentence of verse 16. It says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. So Paul, Paul uses for, uh, for coming what is used as, as for a visit as a person of, of high rank, especially of kings and emperors visiting a province, right? It's saying this isn't just a person coming. This is the king of kings coming down. The second coming also will be of the Lord himself. It's not going to be of some representative. It's going to be a, a host of, of angels coming down. It's going to be of Jesus himself. It will be personal, dramatic. It's going to be public. It's going to be an unmistakable event, a visit in person from our Lord. 
his first advent, right, when Jesus first came here, it, it was in humility and weakness. Right? He came as a baby. As he, baby can't really do anything for himself. At that, that, that point, his deity really was concealed. People didn't believe that he was God. And it was concealed in, in his humanity. Like, who is this, this weak person saying that he is the son of God, saying that he's God himself? But in the second coming, it will be with full glory as the victor over death and evil. People will know at that point, this is God. He is who he says he is. What we're meant to understand is that this authoritative, authoritative divine proclamation announces the end of the age. God in his mercy, he has allowed us to live, to continue on for 2,000 plus years after his ascension. Right? We're, we're still going. Mankind has made tremendous progress in terms of knowledge, but we are very flawed in our nature. And that has become more and more apparent to all who see it. Right? All the advances made seem to be one step forward and two steps backward. We think we're doing well, but we're not. We are becoming more and more sinful. We become more and more selfish in our society and all that we do. It's been put like this. This present world is doomed. The scent of death is upon it. It's committing suicide, and nothing can save it until the coming of Jesus Christ. All the noble efforts of law-abiding citizens to slam the brakes on a sick society and the feverish activity of politicians, so so sociologists, and do-gooders fail to usher in paradise. Right? All these things, we could do all these things, but if they're not God-centered, if they're not for the glory of God, they're not eternally focused, they don't mean a thing and they can't stop the impending doom of the earth. And they can't stop Jesus' return and his judgment upon us, right? Atrocities around the world continue. Jay mentioned in his prayer this morning that the locust of biblical proportions happening in Africa right now. We see COVID-19 happening. They, they continue in our nation, division and hatred. The worship of self grows almost as fast in many places of worship as it does in the world. And we wonder why our effectiveness dies. It dies because we have left the gospel out of much of it, right? If, if you read sermons, a lot of them from, from southern churches from the old times, a lot of them from renowned and not so renowned pastors, you will often be hard pressed to find the gospel, to find the truth in those sermons. But you would often find the worship of country and creed more than of God through our faith shown in good deeds. And so we wait. We, we wait on the Lord's return, and we find hope in that. We see the mess happening all around us. And we say, God, I find hope in your return and in nothing else. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ has the message of salvation, and its fulfillment will be in the personal return of our Lord and Savior, in the return of our King. Well, when is Jesus coming? It's entirely appropriate and reverent to say that only God the Father knows. Regrettably, though, that hasn't stopped many people who claim to be Christians to say, hey, I got the time, I got the date. Those days have come and gone, and those people have been left embarrassed and red faith. Oh, maybe I got it wrong. Well, let's read the Bible. It says nobody knows. Not even Jesus knows. Paul wrote to this, the same to believers, is about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He was echoing the words that Jesus said that nobody knows of the second coming. And he's saying he himself doesn't even know. In Matthew 24, verse 36, he says that. So there's no point, if Jesus, the Son of God, doesn't know, then there's no point of us mere humans trying to figure out the dates. It's a waste of time. Just know that he is coming back. And it's a promise, and he always keeps his promises. God's timetable of events hidden to us means that the return of Jesus 
is going to come as a surprise to an unbelieving and skeptical world. People are going to be thrown off guard. Paul refers to the analogy that Jesus used of his second coming, like a thief in the night, right? How many guys have been robbed before of something, anything? Did the thief send you a save the date? Hey, by the way, I'm coming on uh, June 25th, and I'm going to take half the stuff in your house. <laughs> right? No. My, my brother had his bicycle stolen that we've always kept out in the backyard, and one day we woke up and it was gone. On my birthday, my 18th birthday, I had my car stolen out of my driveway. I would have appreciated a heads up when I left the keys in the car. But that's not the case, right? Just like a thief doesn't announce when he's coming, we don't know when Jesus will return. And so it's going to be a surprise. It's going to catch us off guard. We're going to be outside mowing the lawn. We might just be waking up. Who knows what we're doing? We're carrying on our daily activities. All of a sudden, it's going to happen like a thief in a night. And so, while people are saying peace and safety, they're saying it, they're trying to find it in the things they do, they're striving for, maybe they're saying they're trying to find it in, in some sort of universal health care, maybe they're trying to find it in better stock so that they can have a good retirement. They're finding peace and safety in things that can be destroyed and that moth and rust can knock down. But while they're doing that, destruction will come on them suddenly, and they will not escape. Paul has dealt with the return of King Jesus, and he then tells the implications of the Christians who have died prior to their Lord's return. For them, it's the resurrection. For those who are dead in Christ, they're looking forward to the resurrection. It says this, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Christianity is essentially a religion of resurrection. Now, they use the term religion there, even though it's been... The term religion has been a lot of times put down by the Christian faith. I still like the term because the Bible uses the term religion and says this is what a good religion is to help the, the widows and the orphans and the poor. So when, when a Christian dies, though, it's not the end, and we must, we must realize that. It's true the body is, is laid to rest in the grave, but the soul and the spirit, they live on. The dying but repentant thief crucified with Jesus, right? He was assured of being with the Lord immediately when his life on this earth was about to end. Jesus told him, you'll be with me in paradise. And that's found in Luke 23, verse 43. Death is the gateway into the very presence of God. Paul himself testified, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm, I'm living, living for God right now. But to die is going to be that much better than what I'm, how I'm living here on this earth. That's found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For him, passing through death would bring him a closer, richer, and fuller experience of Christ than what he was already enjoying here on this earth. This is the Christian hope in stark contrast to the world's hopelessness. Right? So often you see people scurrying around trying to get better, trying to do things, trying to find hope in the things they have or the place they live or what they drive. Right? They're striving, but we find our hope in who Jesus is and how we're going to spend eternity. But there's more than what we see here on this earth. It says, once we die, it says the dead in Christ will rise, and they will rise first. Here was real hope for the relations and friends of those who have died as Christians. We are going, we're not going to miss out, right? If we die before Jesus comes back, don't worry. You're not going to miss out. In fact, you're given priority treatment in the order of the events of the second coming. The Apostle Paul had already told his readers that since the Christ who comes is he who, has, who had died, and rose again, so those who had died in him would also now rise with him. Paul tells us that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Christ and his people belong to each other, and they're inseparable forever. Their spirits will be joined with the resurrected bodies. Isn't that awesome? 
a resurrected body. We're going to be free from frailties, free from sickness. We're going to be free from any pains. We're not going to have to worry about getting shots, wearing face masks, catching any type of diseases. No. We're going to be free from all of that and be in God's glorious presence for eternity. None of us know if, if, if our earthly life though will end before Jesus comes again. But if that's the case, we have the wonderful assurance that Paul wrote to his believers in Corinth where he says, the dead will be raised imperishable, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Right? First Corinthians 15, 52 verses 53 say that. So many people in the world have this trying to find a fountain of youth to live forever. God saying, the answer is right here. You want to live forever? Come to a saving knowledge of who I am. Confess your sins and accept me as Lord and Savior, and you will live forever. Paul argued that the body is, is sown, is perishable, and is raised imperishable, and it, it is sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. How can we be sure this is true, though? We can see the promise of resurrection in nature. Winter, which is exceptionally long here in Maine, is a season of, of death, right? We see plant life just die. The leaves fall off the trees. My right? plants get covered. And we see them kind of go into hibernation, but, but they're pretty much dead. But springtime comes, and life bursts forth, especially when we get a lot of rain like we did this last week. We see life start thriving and growing quickly. So our, our creator God has written into nature the principle of resurrection. But the best reason of all for believing in the resurrection of the dead is the fact that Christ himself was raised from the dead. Right? He is the first fruit of the resurrection. Death for all of us is 100% certain. As in Adam, all die. But if we are Christians, so in Christ, all will be made alive. C.S. Lubitsch wrote, Jesus was forced open, has forced open a door that had been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. Everything's different. We have no longer have to fear death as believers. The resurrection of the dead in Christ at his coming is a certainty. But what, how about those for the living? Those of us who might still be alive when Jesus comes back, well, they will be caught up together. Isn't that great? Imagine all those people flying up. It says this, we, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Many have referred to this event as, as the rapture. Now, we don't find that word anywhere in Scripture, the rapture, but neither do we find the word Trinity. Yet it's part of our Christian lingo. Our Christian lexicon has those words because it, it's the best word to describe the suddenness of what Paul is really conveying here. Like you're going to be taken out instantly, right? Paul explains to the believers in Corinth, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. To each Christian is given his or her imperishable, immortal, resurrected body at that time. We'll be all be gathered. First, the dead in Christ will rise, and those who are left here will be taken up. That's amazing. And I'm wondering if all those left behind are going to see that and see like a mass of people just in the sky. Yeah, that's kind of scary for those here on this earth. But this is all amazing and, and supernatural. It, it's incredible apart from having faith in who Jesus is, right? When you read this, it sounds crazy. Questions spring to mind. How is this possible? How can this happen? Why is it only that the Christians will be caught up and the unbelievers left behind? We have to realize that the power of the resurrected Christ is at work. It was God who raised him from the dead. And if we believe in the little resurrection and ascension of Jesus then we should really have no difficulty that we too are going to be raised from the dead. And if he has the power to bring us to life before we existed, 
and he has the power to bring us back to life. These things go right hand in hand with our current faith. And there's the object, objection to, hey, though, things just don't float. Things don't go into the sky on their own. But this overlooks the fact that in the resurrection body of Christ, right, higher laws are op operation there. Jesus, when he had his resurrected body, suddenly was appearing in rooms. And it was his physical body because people were touching him. People were seeing this is real. Yet, he was coming into rooms where doors were closed and locked. So obviously that goes against our laws of nature right now. Think of, of an aircraft, though, right? And at an airport runway. And it's about to take off. And you look at it, you think, right now we know that airplane can fly. But if you've never seen that before, you think, how can something of so much weight leave the ground? There is no way. But that's until we see the power of the engines push it forward. And we understand that the wings cause a lift to that vessel. And it goes into the air with no effort at all. So it, it overcomes the laws of gravity. And so it is with the Lord Jesus. Just as death, the grave could not hold him when his father raised him from the dead in a glorified body. So the earth could not hold him when the time came for him to return to the father. And so it's going to be with Christians worldwide. When they hear the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, those who have been born of the Spirit have with him, within them a magnetic attraction to Jesus. There's nothing we have to do, just like sitting in the airplane. We're just going to be taken up as God calls us. Paul goes on to say that this earth-shattering event will take place in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Again, the questions arise What's the meaning of the clouds in the air? It's helpful to recall there are many Bible references to clouds. At Exodus and Mount Sinai when God revealed himself in the clouds, right? And in the life of Jesus at the transfiguration and ascension, there are clouds and air there. The reference to the air was often thought as a dwelling place of the devil, of the enemy of God. So the fact that the Lord chooses to meet his saints there speaks of his complete mastery over all of creation. No, I, I own the air, the depths of the ocean, the earth. All of it is mine. But whatever imagery or symbolism is used by Paul, there can be no doubt as to the reality that's being portrayed. It's the personal, visible appearance of Jesus Christ and the gathering to him all his people, whether dead or alive at the time when he returns. Paul has clarified his previous teaching to the believers at Thessalonica on the return of the king, on the resurrection of the believing dead, and the living Christians being caught up together. This is the framework of the world's next and last great event. Detailed aspects such as the tribulation, when and for whom, the Antichrist, who is it, the millennial age, is it literal, literal? is it symbolic, pre, post, the return, the final judgment. These are, are given or are hinted to in, in Scripture, but they are secondary to the main event of the return and the resurrection and the rapture. So Paul turns with joyful anticipation to our final point and Paul's final point, eternity with Jesus. And that's what it all boils down to. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The other night when I was laying in bed, a thought seized my mind. And I thought, everybody born, everybody who takes a breath faces eternity. There's no escaping it. Everybody born will spend eternity in hell or eternity in heaven. That thought gripped me brought a sense of fear and urgency into my mind. Not necessarily for me, but for those around me. Oh, my goodness. If these people don't know Jesus, I know what faces them. So as much as we face a glorious hope, and that 
gives us that hope, we should also be, have the urgency to, to share our faith with others so that they too can have that hope because we know while they might not know what faces them, we do know what faces them. If they don't know, they save, have the saving knowledge, knowledge of Jesus Christ. But this here, spending eternity, Jesus coming back, that, that's the climax of the ages, right? The climax of, of all the creation is Jesus coming down again and, and the saints going up. In heaven and earth, they will be united. This is the heart of the Christian hope. This earth is frequently the scene of sad separations, right? We often see people pass. But for the Christian, it will be a thing of the past, never to happen again. There in the presence of the Lord, we will be beyond the reach of evil. We will be beyond the reach of pain. We will be beyond the reach of any suffering. Heaven will be the place of the greatest reunion of all time. I know about you guys, but myself, I was looking forward to our reunion here back, just our little gathering, getting back together. Well, imagine all believers around the whole world being reunited with Jesus forever. What a glorious time that's going to be, and it's never going to end. It's the forever party. So there we will be worshiping God forever. And that's a glorious prospect for the future, but we don't know when it will be. So back to the present. What does the return of the king, the resurrection, being caught up together and eternity in Jesus mean to us in the here and now? It's true that our citizenship is in heaven and that we eagerly await a savior from there. But that's not the and that's not that we should be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. We are called upon to live our daily lives in constant readiness for our Lord's return and certainly for his call. No one but God knows if it will be in our lifetime. We might. So our present task is to work for the kingdom of God as if the return of Jesus will be delayed until the next century. But ready every day as this return is going to be tonight. What a, what a prospect. What more can be said but the final words of Revelation? Come, Lord Jesus. And so I close this morning's message with the reading of verse 18 as a challenge of each of us after hearing all that we have. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father God, what awesome and amazing words we just read this morning in your scripture. We thank you, Lord, for that glorious hope, knowing that your Son, our Savior, our King, is going to return. Knowing that if we die before that happens, we will We'll be caught up in the clouds anyway. You will call us forth from the grave or wherever our bodies are. And that if we're alive, that we too will be called up, Lord, to meet your son in the clouds. Lord, while that is a great and glorious hope for us, let us not be so focused on that that we forget to live for you here on this earth, that we forget to share your love with others, that we forget to share the good news with others, Lord. Lord, because since we know the truth, we know the other side of the coin, that those who don't know you have eternal damnation, Lord. So because we know you love them, and we should love them too, let that love drive us to show them who you are, to teach them the truth so that they too can have that hope. Lord, let us be able to overcome the barriers by the power of your Holy Spirit to minister to all those that we come in contact with. Lord, we do this all for your glorious name. Lord, because you are the only one worthy of worship and praise. So, Lord, as we go out from this week, I pray that you would guide us and direct our lives. Give us opportunities and let us be able to see the opportunities to share the good news with others. So that all that we say and do will give you honor and glory. 
We pray all these things in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.